Good morning. Happy 4th of July. We're so excited that you're tuning in to our service this morning. My name is Alex. I'm one of the pastors here at The Orchard. I hope that you uh, are having a great day. And as we join in worship this morning, we want to pray to kind of center our hearts and our minds upon what we are about to to hear and to worship God through. So if you want to pray with me, uh, let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning. God, grateful for the gift of technology to bring us together, even though we're in separate rooms and in separate places. So, Father, wherever we may find ourselves this morning, we ask that you would be close to us, that your spirit would be near to us as counselor, as comforter, as guide today. As we open up your scripture, as we dive into your word, may you illuminate it, may you bring it to life to us uh, as we seek to study it and to learn more about you and about how you've called us to live. Father, join us in this time. Bless our time together this morning. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Revelation is more about faith than fear, more about hope than dismay, more about the mark of the lamb than the mark of the beast. The book of Revelation is more beautiful than we have ever imagined. Everything God intended in the Garden of Eden will be restored in the New Jerusalem, the city of God. Garden to city. When I was a kid in summers like the one we're experiencing right now, you can find me in my backyard on our playset, on our, our playset and our swing set. And I, and I wouldn't be swinging or using the playset for anything that it was designed to do, but for me, I'd have my toy lightsaber in one hand and the power of the force in the other hand, and I would be a Jedi fending off hordes of stormtroopers and other monsters as I defended uh, whatever castle or whatever uh, structure my playset was in my imagination. Or I would be in, again, in the blistering heat of summer in my dad's leather jacket that just swallowed me up and a fedora that I bought at Cracker Barrel and I would be Indiana Jones searching for some lost treasure and and from some lost civilization crawling up underneath the playset thinking that I was in some jungle and some far reaches uh, some far reach place in the world I love playing pretend. I love I loved using my imagination to go figure out brand new adventures to go on. And I'm sure you're you're the same way when you were a kid. Playing pretend is something that we all share in common. And, and my question is, why do you think kids do that? Um, well, why do you think kids, or, you, or why do you think people do that? Why why do you think they play pretend? Why do you think they love it? Well, well, I think it's because in the innocence of our childhood and and the innocence of our hearts, we we. We long to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We long to go on a grand adventure, some, some story that we can get caught up in and, and some role that we can play in that story. We long to be a part of that. Well, John, in our text today, as we continue in our series called Garden to City, Walking Through Revelation, he's going to be telling us a grand story that, that, that is very much not pretend. It's very much not an imaginary tale, but it's one that we get to play a part in, even today. So we're going to be in Revelation chapter 12. If you have a Bible or device and you want to turn there and and join us as we read together. Uh, But as I said, we're continuing in a series, walking through the book of Revelation. Our series is called Garden of Cities. We look at what God uh, has done, is, is doing, and will do to bring about His kingdom here on earth. Um, So Revelation chapter 12 is where we're going to be. I'm going to read it, then pray, and then we're going to dive right in uh, to talking about the text. Let's let's read it. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. And then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and and ten horns with seven crowns on his head. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, who was to rule all the nations with an iron rod. And her child was snatched away from the dragon and was caught up to to God and, and to his throne. And the woman fled to the wilderness where God had prepared a place to care for her for 1,260 days. Then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. 
And the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown to earth with all of his angels. And then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last. Salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of, his bro- of our brothers and sisters have been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens rejoice. But terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, but she was given two wings like those of a great eagle, so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. There she would be cared for and protected from the dragon for a time, times, and half a time. Then the dragon tried to drown the woman with the flood of of water that flowed from his mouth. But the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out of the mouth of the dragon. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who kept God's commandments and maintained their testimony for Jesus. And then the dragon took his stand on the shore beside the sea. Let's pray together. God, as we open your text this morning, as we read this story, I pray that you allow it to speak to us in ways that we, um, in ways that we need, in ways that we need to hear from you. God, open our hearts to receive uh, your word this morning, because God, that is, that is what we need to survive. Man does not live by bread alone. People do not live by by food alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. And so, God, as we read your word today, let it be our sustenance, our nourishment, so that we can live on in this world as your people. In your name we pray. Amen. So we've been looking through the book of Revelation for four weeks now. So I'm going to assume that you, you know what, what all's going on and we can just kind of move on. I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I feel like the more we get into Revelation, the more complicated and, uh, and the more context is needed. Uh, but that's okay. That's why we're here. That's why uh, we're walking through this series together. That's, 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 uh, that's why we as your pastors are exp- want to explain the text. That's why we're doing Wednesday night classes. It's because the, deep, the deeper we go, the more context is needed. And we want to prepare you guys for how to read the scriptures and how it applies to your life. Um, so let's catch up a little bit on context before we continue through chapter 12. So our story is being told by John. And this is the same John who is with Jesus for three years of his life. The same, the same John who wrote the Gospel of John and, and the, first, uh, the, the letters 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. This is the same exact John who was a disciple of Jesus. And at this point in his life, he's exiled on the island of Patmos, which is a prison island. And on this island, he is given a revelation of Jesus. He, Jesus comes to him and, and says, hey, I want, I want you to see all of this. I want you to write it all down. And Jesus begins to show John all of these visions and symbols of what's going on in the world and what God's going to do about it all. It's a vision of what has happened, what is happening, and what will happen all at the same time. And today, John's vision is one that's a little confusing. Like, well, like the rest of them are really clear, right? <laughs> We're just kind of continuing on uh, the trajectory here. And in Revelation 12, John sees many characters and events. He sees a woman, a baby, a dragon. He sees some angels and some demons. He sees a war and a victory. And and now, like we've we've set up here before, we've said on Sundays before, Revelation doesn't have some secret code that tells us about when Jesus is coming back or like if the mark of the beast is this thing or if it's that thing. Um, But what Revelation is doing, and specifically Revelation 12, is it's telling us the amazing story of Scripture. It's telling us uh, through symbols and events all the things that God has done in the world. It's kind of like reading the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, They they themselves, those seven books, are individual stories, right? Magician's Nephew, Lion, Lion, Witcher, and Wardrobe, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Those are all individual stories. But they contain symbols and events that C.S. Lewis is using to tell about another story. 
Now, I'm not equating the Chronicles of Narnia and the Word of God found in Revelation. Uh, I'm just trying to show how John is communicating to us using symbols and, and signs to, to, sh- to tell us a, a, a grand narrative, to tell us a story. And the story begins with John seeing a woman, and she's clothed with the sun and the, and the moon beneath her feet. She's beautiful, and she has a crown of t- with 12 stars on her head, and she's about to give birth, and she's in pain going through, uh, child, uh, going through the birthing process because this baby is on its way. It is coming. And then John sees a dragon, a large red dragon. Now, the color red in Revelation and also in Star Wars means that whatever, it, whatever is red is evil. And, and so, so John says this is a red dragon. This is an evil dragon. And it has seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns. Now, numbers and symbols are important in Revelation. And again, they're not secret. They're just contextual. Heads in the ancient world... Uh, represent being and and horns represented power so when john says he sees this this dragon with seven heads and and ten horns what he's saying is all of this dragon's being what what this what makes this dragon this dragon all of this dragon's being is caught up in the desire for power and control and might over everything else this dragon positions itself to devour the baby that, that is being born. And the question is, why? Well, frankly, this, this dragon is caught up in, in, in being in control, right? So he wants to, to usurp whatever God's plan is, to usurp God himself so that he can be in control. Now, let, let's pause real quick for a moment and let, let's reflect on that. Isn't that the story of the Bible? People in pain and suffering awaiting the birth of of a baby that is the culmination of all of their hopes and dreams. And and a demonic beast who desires nothing but power for himself. Um, and, and And that's the ultimate temptation that he gives to the people of the Bible to take control of their own destiny. I mean, that's the temptation to Adam and Eve in the garden, is it not? The, the, the temptation uh, that the people of Israel faced when they wanted a king like all the other nations. They wanted to take control of their own power. They wanted to seize their own destiny. And so often that's our temptation as well. You know, control your own life. Take control. Seize power. Do what you want and take what you want. And then the vision continues. And the woman gives birth to a son, and John sees that this child is to rule the nations with an iron rod. Now, that, that wording is a direct callback to Psalm chapter 2. And you don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. But this is what Psalm chapter 2 says. Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The, the rulers plot, plot against the Lord and against his anointed one, but the one who rules in heaven laughs. And the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem, on my holy mountain. The Lord says to this king, only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. The whole earth is your possession. You will break them with an iron rod. There it is. And smash them like clay pots. So when John sees this baby and and uses this language from Psalm 2, it is a direct callback to this baby being the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And and this baby is not devoured by the dragon, but instead he's snatched away to be cared for by God. And this is the turning point in the chapter. Because a battle takes place. A battle for the very soul of creation. The battle that begins not with a prince riding in on some stallion with a sword in hand, but instead begins with the birth of a baby boy. Now, now you don't have to be a preacher to know where I'm going with this, right? Uh, this baby is Jesus. He is the king that's been born to rule the nations, to, to destroy all who oppose the way of God and, and God's peace and grace and love. And his birth begins the battle for the very heart of the universe. When Jesus came and, and, and as a baby, when he was born, he initiated the, ver- the, the, the battle for the very soul of creation. 
And He has come to destroy the powers and principalities of this fallen world and to restore this world and all of the universe to the way that it was always meant to be. Not through grabbing power for Himself, not by taking control or, or manipulating or seizing power, but instead on, uh, through, through taking on the true position of humility and love. Jesus is God in flesh. And if that is true, then everything Jesus did represents the very heart of who God is. This means that that at the very heart of God is the cross. This symbol of death and destruction that, the, that this, this, this symbol of death that the Romans used to, to put people to death and then show them off to scare all the other nations, this, this symbol of the ultimate punishment becomes a symbol of self-sacrificial love and mercy. The cross represents everything that Jesus is about. He, he didn't come to manipulate power or to seize control. He's not like the red dragon. No, Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve himself. Or he came to serve others. He himself came to serve. That's what I'm going to say. He didn't, have, he didn't come to have people wait on him and dote on him. But instead he came so that he could wash the feet of liars, traitors, adulterers and murderers he came to save us he came to release us from the chains of this world and from our own propensity to harm and destroy both ourselves and our fellow people he came to show us that that the true way of life is not found through attaining power or notoriety or fame but through love and grace, and mercy, and humility. Jesus represents everything that the dragon is not. Jesus represents everything that our world is not. No wonder the dragon wants to devour him. No wonder Satan longs to destroy him, and he tries to. You see, Satan manipulates and schemes in order to have Jesus murdered on that cross, but Jesus even defeats death. He resurrects. And he ascends into heaven, the very throne of God, just as John says happens to the baby. The birth of the baby, the incarnation, initiates the battle. And the cross of Christ declares his victory. Though the battle has to be played out, the end result is sealed. Satan loses and is destroyed. That's why a shout of victory takes place when the dragon is cast from heaven after the baby is snatched away. And it's a great shout that we get to take part in. It's, it's a shout of victory that, you, that you'd think would be the end of the story. But, it, but it's not. It's not the end of the story at all. Remember how we said earlier about how um, kids like to play pretend? How they like to use their imagination for to go on adventures and, and to, to think of crazy scenarios that they get to be a part of. Well, I actually think that we still do this as adults. We may not pretend that we're catching the game-winning uh, game winning ball in, in, in Game 7 of the World Series or, or catching a game-winning touchdown or we're fighting some dragon unless you're into LARPing, which that's cool if you are. But, but instead, what I think we, we do is we pretend that we are not a part of this story. We pretend that the story that John is telling us, the story of the Bible, isn't happening all around us every day. We, we pretend that it just only exists in this book, and that it only exists on Sundays, and, and we put it in a box and we put it away on Monday through Saturday. We pretend that it has no repercussions on our life whatsoever. We pretend that we're not living in the midst of victory, being won by Jesus, and that the battle for the very souls of people isn't still happening. We, we pretend that this battle between Satan and all of creation isn't our reality. And, and honestly, I think our form of, of pretending takes on, 
takes on a certain numbness or nihilism or even some form of deism, which, which basically all this means is, is we believe to our core or we pretend that like nothing we do matters, that it's all meaningless. That's, that's, what, we, that's what we believe, I feel like, in, as a culture. Or we think that God is distant, that he, he doesn't really care, that if God even exists, he for sure doesn't care about little old me or little old you. I, I feel like that's what our culture believes. It, it may not be what we say, but it's what we believe in our hearts. We believe that life is meaningless and we live with blinders on to the fact that our life has purpose and calling. We pretend that our stories don't really matter. Like we're just a collection of atoms or dust just spinning about at some crazy uh, speed through the vacuum of space. We live in this fantasy land of feeling like our only goals in life is to make enough money to retire and then one day die. But what if I told you that that's not our reality? What if I told you that what culture says is reality is not? Well, here's another question for you. Who do you think the woman represents in the story? You see, John's pretty clear about the baby being Jesus and the dragon being Satan. But, but who do you think the woman is? It's tempting to think that she represents somebody else in the, in the Bible. That she might represent Eve, the first woman. Or she might represent Israel as a nation. Or, or maybe Mary. And she might represent all three of those things. Very well could. But what if this woman was someone else? Someone much more personal. What what if she was us? The church. Who in the midst of persecution and suffering and pain brought the life of Jesus into the world, not just back then, but today. We, in the midst of our ordinary, everyday life, get to bring Jesus in the midst of all of it. See, that's what I believe. I believe the woman represents us. So whether you're an accountant and your job is doing paperwork and and figuring out all the ways that that a business gets to run, or or whether you're a a cop out on patrol or a teacher or, or whatever you do, you get to bring Jesus into the midst of whatever situation and circumstance you find yourself in. You, you get to bring Jesus into the midst of our current chaos and confusion, and we get to offer peace and love to the world around us. We get to bring Jesus into the marriage that is suffering. We get to bring the presence of Jesus into the wound and pain of our friend uh, who just got told that they have cancer. We get to bring Jesus into whatever it is that is bringing chaos and confusion into creation. You see, we live in a culture and in a world where the ultimate temptation is to take control, to take power, and to take and form our own story and our own destiny. But the story that John is telling us is is not only the story of the Bible, but it's our story too. We get to bring Jesus and let Him be the main character of the story. We get to bring Him into whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. And we get to put the powers and the principalities of Satan and remind Him that that His time is coming short and we get to put them on notice. That is the reality that we get to live in every day. The reality that our lives and our story matter. You matter. I matter. Because we are the ones Jesus chooses in order to enter into our world today. We are the way that Jesus gets to enter our world today. That doesn't mean that we're all of a sudden immune to pain. I want want to be clear. Quite the opposite. I mean, if you look back at the story, the woman is forced to run into the wilderness. and She's forced to retreat, to fall back. And that looks like a loss. But but right after she retreats, there's a shout of victory. Why is that? Well, it's because that God is still there in the wilderness providing for her. Just like in the midst of our pain and our suffering and our wounds, God is still right there providing for us. Because He cares for us. Because He loves us. And it can feel like victory because it's not even our battle to fight. It's His battle. And He will win it. He has won it through the cross of Christ. And that's 
And that's our reality. The reality of resurrection in the midst of death. The reality of joy in the midst of suffering and pain. Peace in the midst of chaos and confusion. That is the reality we now get to live in. The reality of the victory of the cross. Jesus is the main character of the story. And we get to play a role in that story by introducing him to the world. Guys, it's time that we wake up to that reality. We are living in the midst of a grand story that is much larger than ourselves. We are living in the midst of a grand narrative bigger than our wildest dreams. And we have a part to play. Our lives are not meaningless. We're not purposeless. We have a role. You see, what we wanted as kids and the innocence of our hearts to be a part of a bigger story, what we wanted then is our reality now. Walking with God means realizing that we are living in a reality with meaning and purpose and adventure. A reality where Jesus has won the victory over chaos and evil. And we get to share that victory with everybody we come in contact with. Starting with looking in the mirror. This world desperately needs to hear about that victory. To hear about love and freedom and grace and mercy. We get to be caught up in the greatest story ever told. We get to play a role in the grand story of the Bible and, sh- and join with the heavens and shout out and say, we defeated Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. By Jesus' death on the cross, we are now set free. Free from the slavery of the rat race of life. Free from having to base our worth on productivity or success or personal brand. Free free from the fear of meaninglessness. And free to have true joy and love and true mercy flow both in us and through us. No more drifting through life. No more living without purpose. But now every day has a mission to bring Jesus with all of his love into the world around us. Well, how do we do that? We do it by doing what Jesus said to do, which is to love God with everything we have and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that's the really cool thing about the practices of faith. When you practice you know, reading your Bible, reading Scripture, um, praying, fasting, silence, solitude, Sabbath, all of these practices that we've talked about before train us how, on how to bring Jesus into our current reality. They reorient our thoughts and our minds and our hearts around the main character. They remind us that we are not the center of the story, but he is. And his mission in the world. That is the role of the church. That's the role of us as a body of believers, specifically uh, to bring Jesus into our current reality. And, and our role as your pastors is to help you do that. To, sh- to help you practice your faith beyond just showing up on Sunday or watching online. So if, if, if you need help doing that, if you'd like ideas on how you can practice your faith in a more practical way, please let us know. Comment on this video. We'd love to help you do that. I, I obviously love talking about this stuff, so reach out to me. But here's the truth. If you don't hear anything I say, hear this. Our reality now is greater than anything we could ever imagine because we are ambassadors for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who is victorious for all time forever. Amen. So, my, my dad's a history professor. And, and so I grew up hearing all kinds of stories about uh, and tales of the world and, and what all has happened in, in, in the past and how you know, it affects our present. You know, all, this, all this stuff. Well, one particular story that I'm familiar with is, um, I'm sure that we all are if you grew up in the United States, is the story of D-Day and on June 6, 1944. Um, it's the story of Allied forces and their invasion of Normandy, France, uh, and, and their, when, when they began their invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe. And now, the World, the, the World War II, it didn't end on June 6th. But most scholars agree that that was the beginning of the end for the Nazi empire. They, they, they agree that because D-Day was successful, the evil, tyrannical Nazis uh, would lose the war. And eventually they did. A year later, uh, almost a year later, on May 8th, 1945, that day is known as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. And, and there were still battles to be fought. 
But the Allies really started to win the war on D-Day. The, the victory that started on D-Day was completed on VE Day. So why do, why do I tell you that? Why does this matter? Well, the Christian life has its own version of D-Day and its own version of VE Day. And we live in the in-between. The cross or, or, or Jesus, coming as a, Jesus coming as a baby and his life and his death and resurrection was D-Day. It began the victory. It's, it's the day God sealed the victory there on the cross. He sealed the victory for us and he sealed our freedom. It's when Satan was defeated. But there are still battles to be fought. There's still, there's still a, a future one day when Jesus will finally come back, when he will return. And victory will be sealed forever and ever. And that's our VE day. We stand in the in-between. We stand in the already. Jesus has already won. The victory has already been sealed. The kingdom has already come. We stand between the already and the not yet. And that, that's what the Christian life is called, the already and the not yet. And Satan, knowing that he's been defeated, is doing what cornered enemies do. He's attacking us. And he's still trying to, to knock us down and confuse us through chaos and hatred. But he knows that he's lost. And every day, every single moment, we get to bring about the victory of Jesus wherever we go. We get to remind people, we get to remind ourselves that Jesus has won. In the midst of our pain and suffering, in the midst of trials and tribulations, Jesus has won. He is victorious. We get to remind ourselves of that every day until one day Jesus will come and there will be no more dragon and there will be no more chaos. There will be no more cancer. There will be no more death. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more tears. So take heart, church. We don't have to pretend anymore. We can live in the reality that Jesus is one forever. Let's pray. God, I thank you for our time together. And I ask that you seal on our hearts the reality of your kingdom. So that whether it's just to ourselves and to our families or to people at work or wherever we find ourselves, we, we remind ourselves that Jesus is one. And we remind ourselves that we are free free from slavery to sin and death, now and forever. To your Father, in the name of Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Now is the time for response. And you can respond however you see fit. You can pause this video and pray. You can uh, comment down below and let us know if there's anything you'd like pray prayer about. Um, and it, but if there's anything in particular that stood out to you today, I'm, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to invite you to message our account or to, to leave a comment on this video. We want to connect with you, and, and we want to walk with you. And we want to remind you that Jesus has won victory, not just for me or not just for someone else, but for you, so that you don't have to be trapped or enslaved anymore. You can be free, and things can be different. And we, we'd love to hear from you. Respond however you see fit. We now come to the time of our service for the offering. As always, the offering is for those that consider this place their home. If you are a guest with us today, if you've just been scrolling through your feed and you ended up watching our whole video, we're so excited that you did, but we ask that you would not give unless you feel specifically moved to do so. But if this is your home, if this is your primary place of worship, this is our opportunity to give to in response to a God who has given us everything. So let's pray for this time uh, together. Father, uh, it is with open hands that we say thank you. God, we say thank you for all the gifts that you have given us. We know that every good gift comes from above. And so, Lord, even the breath in our lungs this morning, even opening our eyes today, is a gift. It's a gift of another day to serve you, to learn more about you, to live more like Jesus in this world. So, Father, with whatever we have, whether we feel like it is a lot or whether we feel like it is a little, God, we give more to you today in offering. 
in hopes, Lord, that you can do an amazing work with it. So, Father, we pray in faith uh, that the gifts given today would be used for your glory and for your glory alone, that you can do an amazing work with what we have to offer. God, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Before you click out of this video, just a few things I want to make you aware about in the life of our church. Some announcements really quickly. First is that coming up we have our VBS event on July 18th. This is a Sunday evening event and VBS at the Orchard is for everyone. So whether you're a member of our church, whether you're tuning in for the first time, whether you have kids or whether you don't have kids, we want you to be at VBS worshiping with us. We're going to have adult programming. We're going to have the same normal uh, kids programming with kids. Uh, crafts and games and all kinds of fun, exciting VBS things. Uh, But VBS is for everyone. So we hope that you'll join us. We ask that you would register online, either on our app or on our website for that event so that we can know how many many meals to provide, how many materials that we'll need for crafts, all that kind of thing. So we want to encourage you to come to that, but also to invite a friend to VBS on July 18th. Second thing I want to make you aware about is our Next Level Conference. Next Level Conference is happening on August 14th on a Saturday morning. We're going to serve breakfast, and we are going to to talk about what it means to be a growing leader. As as yourself that you're growing, but also a leader who is growing other leaders, who is developing other leaders. So if you're interested in that leadership conference, we want to encourage you to sign up for that, to register for that event again on our app or on our website, or by texting our church number at at Oxnext. You can text that for more information and to get you registered for that. Invite a friend who's in, is maybe interested in serving and what that looks like in the capacity of our church and in leadership, and we want to invite you to that again on August 14th. That's all that we have for you this morning. We're excited that you've tuned in, that you've watched to this point. We ask that you share this video with a friend, and I have the hope that you have a great week. See ya. Mm-hmm.